So I'd like to welcome you to uh, the event uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Thank you for coming to the second annual lecture in Canadian Studies and Collective Book Launch, which I'll explain later. My name is Colin Coates. I'm director of the Robart Centre for Canadian Studies. Et uh, j'aimerais vous souhaiter la bienvenue à ce, cette uh, con deuxième conférence annuelle en études uh, canadiennes. Vous m'entendez? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, the Robart Center of Canadian Studies has a goal to highlight, encourage, and assist high-level uh, scholarship uh, on Canada at York University. And for that reason, we created this, uh, this annual lecture series and collective book launch. One of our goals is to recognize the achievements of distinguished Canadianist scholars at York University. And as many of you know, last year, Professor Bettina Bradbury from History and Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies uh, presented the first lecture in the series. Is that echoing now? Is that... That's okay? Okay. I'm, I'm more concerned... That, uh, this has been recorded for posterity, so I'm more concerned for Pat that this is uh, making sense. Uh, that, that, that sounds right. Uh, the, this uh, series is patterned after a British inaugural lecture where distinguished professors have an opportunity to talk about themselves and their work to their colleagues. In fact, it's a way of them having to sing for their supper because they've just become a full professor and they have to essentially justify that to their colleagues. This isn't quite as formal as that, uh, but I think it is a, a, an opportunity to again celebrate and welcome uh, one of the most uh, distinguished Canadian scholars at the university. This year, Professor Pat Armstrong uh, very kindly agreed to present this lecture. She is one of the most prominent researchers in the area of health policy and health care in Canada and in the study of women's work and is a member of the sociology department in the School of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies. I'm not going to do a formal presentation but I, my colleague Leah Vosco has agreed to do so. Leah holds the Canada Research Chair in the Political Economy of Gender and Work and she's agreed to introduce Pat today. But before that I want to say a couple of things about the Robart Centre and one other thing about Pat, which I suspect Leah may not say, and uh, that is that Pat has a long history in Canadian studies as a multidiscipline, having her MA in Canadian studies from Carleton University. She was director of the School of Canadian Studies at Carleton, and she remains an adjunct professor of Canadian studies at that university. And therefore, she has a long-standing dedication to multidisciplinary research on Canada, in addition to her disciplinary-focused research. And that is one of the reasons, I think, that she is such an important, uh, such an appropriate person to give the lecture today. I, I just want to take a, a, a few seconds to say a few things about the activities of the Robart Centre. Uh, there are scrolling through on, uh, at least some of them are scrolling through on the PowerPoint slides here. Again, one of our aims is to encourage multidisciplinary discussion through what we call research clusters. We have three research clusters at present, one on Black Canada, a second on Indigenous Peoples and the Environment, and a third one on Landscapes and Soundscapes of Canada. And each of these uh, research clusters hosts different types of events which bring together scholars at all levels, so graduate uh, and, uh, uh, and faculty, to engage in discussions and debates. We have also have two prizes that are awarded through the Robart Centre, the Odessa Prize, which is offered to the, the best essay written by a, a student in fourth year uh, on a Canadian topic, and last year, Unfortunately, it's not, I'm not going to time it right, but it was won by Lindsay Moore, who won it for her honors thesis in communication studies. This is the uh, a, a prize that's funded by Irvin Studen, very generously gave us the money to, uh, to run this prize, and we do welcome submissions for this. So please take away flyers and encourage, well, think of your students and think of, uh, please let your colleagues know that uh, we would welcome uh, nominations for that. Um, the uh, second prize is the Barbara Goddard Prize, which is for the best uh, dissertation on a Canadian topic defended at York University in the previous calendar year. And this is the moment where I announce for the first time publicly the uh, winner, and that is Jamie Yard, who won for her dissertation in social anthropology last year. Um, 
We also uh, provide assistance, the Robert Centre, in, in trying to encourage Canadian scholarship. We provide assistance with grant administration and applications. And one example of that is the Shirk Partnership Grant that is led by Professor Anna Hudson in Fine Arts. It's on Inuit performance, and that's running through the centre. We have a number of activities just in this couple of weeks because we really like being busy in early October. And uh, just next Monday, again scrolling through there, is the 250th anniversary of the Royal Proclamation, a very important document in Canadian history. We'll be hosting a roundtable discussion and we'll be launching a special edition of Canada Watch on that topic with a number of distinguished contributors to that. A week tomorrow, we have the first in our, our seminar series, and that one is on a fairly technical topic of data mining and the analysis of commodity flows in the British world in, in the 19th century. And there's a, well, in the PowerPoint, but there's a flyer over there too if you're interested. Finally, I just want to mention uh, that this is uh, the year before we go into a, uh, a rechartering exercise for the Robart Center. It's very important for us to hear from members of the York community about what the Robart Center, what directions the Robart Center should take. And we need participation from York colleagues and advice as to future directions for this center. And we'd, we'd very much welcome that. But to return to today's event, this is again a celebration of Canadian theme research uh, at York University. Uh, and uh, we are going to start with uh, Leah's introduction. Pat Armstrong will give her talk, and then we will uh, make a transition into the collective book launch. And uh, as you've undoubtedly noticed already, there are some copies on display. These are copies belonging to the authors, so please don't run away with those. But if you want to purchase some of the books or different books that our, the bookstore has provided, uh, please do so. I'm very pleased that the bookstore has agreed to come again this year to, to do this, and uh, again, to uh, celebrate some of the work that's done at the university. Please once the, the, the discussion is all over, please stay for the reception afterward. And uh, given the present uh, financial climate, I do want to assure you that no university or government funds have been sacrificed to provide for the wine today. But there will be wine later on. So I'll turn the mic over to Leah. Leah, thank you very much. I'm delighted today to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Professor Pat Armstrong, this year's Robarts Lecturer in Canadian Studies. Uh, Pat Armstrong is professor in the Department of Sociology and the School of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies here at York University, where she has taught since 1986. Among her numerous accomplishments, Professor Armstrong has held a Canada Health Services Re Research Foundation Canadian Institute of Health Research Chair in Health Services, a mouthful. She is a distinguished research professor in sociology. She is a recipient of the Award for Outstanding Contribution to Sociology, granted by the Canadian Sociology and Anthropology Association. And she recently became a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Professor Armstrong is widely published in the fields of social policy, women and work, and health and social services. She is author and co-author of some 15 books, many of which have appeared in more than one edition, editor or co-editor of some 12 further books, and she has a very strong list of published chapters, refereed articles, and technical reports. Indeed, most recently, she has co-authored and co-edited books as far-ranging as thinking Women and Healthcare Reform in Canada, women, Women's Health Intersections of Research Policy and Practice, They Deserve Better, The Long-Term Care Experience in Canada and Scandinavia, A Place to Call Home, Long-Term Care uh, in Canada, Critical to Care, The Invisible uh, Women in Health Services, and Wasting Away, The Undermining of Canadian Healthcare. So much of her scholarship addresses and indeed elevates as a central theme analytically the relationship between paid and unpaid work. In addition to her numerous writings, Pat Armstrong was recently chair of the Women and Healthcare, um, uh, of Women and Healthcare Reform, a group that was funded by Health Canada and the acting director of the National Network for Environments and Women's Health. She is currently the co-director of uh, York's Ontario Training Center, a member of the boards of York's, uh, of both York's Institute for Health Research and Global Labor Research Center, and she has served as chair of York's Department of Sociology and director of the School of Canadian Studies at Carleton. She's also a board member of uh, 
the Canadian Health Coalition, and the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Pat has also served as an expert witness in more than a dozen cases, has been heard before bodies ranging from the federal court to federal human rights tribunals on issues related to women's health care work and also to pay equity. She has been a co-investigator and a principal investigator on a large number of research grants focused primarily on women in work, women's health, and health care. Professor Armstrong's current research is focused on reimagining long-term residential care and involves a major collaborative research project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Now this is just a taste of Pat Armstrong's key accomplishments. There are many, many more. Um, and as I rarely have the opportunity to introduce Pat, I cannot but take the advantage of this lovely occasion to mention my own connection with her. Pat is a very close colleague of mine. I've worked with her for over 20 years. We work together on editorial boards and boards of research centers. We have co-edited a book together. We supervise graduate students together. I serve as an advisor on her current and exemplary MCRI. And she, in turn, has been a co-investigator on a couple of projects that I've overseen over the years, um, uh, contributing richly to the comparative perspectives on precarious employment database, the gender and work database, and a community research, university research alliance on precarious employment. The three things that I enjoy most about Pat are, first, her sharp intellect and her consistent willingness to share ideas, as she will do with us today. Second, her gentle sense of humor, apparent in everything from the many quick-witted titles of her talks and writings, to her attempts to coach students confronting challenges in um, pursuing fieldwork. And third, and foremost in my mind, is of course Pat's delight, true to her political commitments, in engaging in non-hierarchical, genuinely collaborative research directed at progressive social change. Pat is a model of a feminist public intellectual and one I can only hope to emulate in my own career. The title of her talk this afternoon is Working for Care, Caring for Work. So please join me in welcoming Pat Armstrong. Apparently I'm accompanied by music. I don't know how I follow that anyway. Maybe we should just all drink and, and uh, then go home. Uh, well, when I was preparing for today, I thought as I often do of an old story told of Nellie McClung, and I don't have to tell anyone here that she was a suffragette and like most suffragettes was into the Christian Temperance Union. And she used to go around and give students lectures on the evils of alcohol and she'd take a glass of water uh, and she a worm and she'd put it in the glass and it would wiggle around and she'd take it out and uh, put it into a glass of alcohol and it would shrivel up and die and she'd ask the students what they learned today and one day a little girl put up her hand at the back of the room and said lady if you drink booze you don't get worms <laughs> and I thought of this story because uh, apocryphal or not because I have two views of today uh, one, on the one hand, it's a wonderful honor, and I'm truly grateful, especially for Col to Colin for his hard work and to Leah for that wonderful introduction. I could say it's mutual. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, uh, I was asked to talk about my contributions to the study of Canada, and, and uh, it's, it seems very un-Canadian uh, in some ways, and I have to say it makes me feel a little more than a little old to do so. Um, I've titled this lecture, Working for Care and Caring for Work, because it's about my work, it's about the people with whom I work, and it's about those who do the work of care. As a feminist political economist, I've had the privilege to be part of a uniquely Canadian perspective. Some of the foremost practitioners are here at York, Leah, of course, being one of the most prominent, Meg Luxton, Noreen Pupo, Issa Backer, Patricia McDermott, uh, Ina Dua, Ann Porter, Stephanie Ross, Tamara Daly, Mark Thomas, to mention only a few. As we explained in our book, Wasting Away, 
The political economy refers to the complex of institutions and relations that constitute not only what are conventionally referred to as the political and economic systems, but also the social, physical, and ideological and cultural systems. Or as Patricia Marchak put it in her review of political economy, it is the study of power derived from or contingent on a system of property rights, the historical development of power relationships, and the cultural and social embodiment of them. In my view, Canadian feminist, and I should say English Canadian feminist political economy, is unique for a number of reasons. First, we learn from and with others who take different perspectives, constantly developing our theory and research in response. Perhaps it reflects our small country as much as our willingness to share or be nice. Uh, and of course, it has not always been bread and roses or politeness. There, there have been what can only be called quite rigorous debates. Nevertheless, this cross-fertilization makes us stand out, as several international authors, such as Michelle Barrett, have pointed out. Second, feminist political economy engages with Canadian work. And like E.P. Thompson, we see research as a dialogue between theory and evidence. The empirical work takes multiple forms, with an understanding that theory and method are inextricably linked. These two are in constant formation. Third, we have stressed and explored the relationship between paid and unpaid work, as Leah said, as well as the relationship among all kinds of labor, volunteer, underground, waged, salaried, domestic, private, and public sector, and deconstructed those sectors and the categories, developing increasingly complex understandings in the process. Fourth, we do both lumping, as US feminist Deborah Stone puts it, and slicing, as the British sociologist Miriam Glucksmann's con uh, concept puts it. The lumping refers to looking for what women have in common, what they share. The slicing refers to understanding the multiple and complex lives of particular people in particular places, based on smaller commonalities and fundamental inequities. Fifth, we understand that those who do the work are usually the best source of information about that work, and similarly, that those who receive the care are a good source of information about the care. As Dorothy Smith makes clear, the approach starts from the standpoint of women and allows women's voices to be heard. But it locates those voices within larger contexts and power relations with the purpose of creating understandings that can lead to structural change. Sixth, we're focused on making change in and out of the classroom, which means we have to understand Canada albeit a Canada located in a global context, and we must work with others outside academe. Those others include unions and policymakers, community and religious organizations. Not always a simple combination, and certainly not without tensions, indeed rather messy at times, a bit like democracy in general, at least when we have democracy in practice. Seventh, we work with other academics, not only to conduct research, but also to turn research into practice. This means developing research with others, making work accessible in plain language, and sharing it in multiple ways with multiple audiences. Today, often called knowledge mobilization, although in the 60s we called it praxis. The work is about using evidence for change, while recognizing, as Dr. Jorge from the European Health Observatory puts it, that, quote, ideas travel faster when you have less evidence to weigh them down, end of quote. Or as Bob White, former president of the CIW, made clear, it's more the power behind your argument than the power of your argument that makes change. Unfortunately, we increasingly have policy-based evidence rather than evidence-based policy, but I still think it's worth the work. I should be clear that my version, and this is my version of Canadian feminist political economy, and it's based on a recent review I did of the literature on feminist political economy and on my own perspective as it's developed over many years, and indeed, it has been many years. 
My use of we may be confusing. A lot of my work has been done with Hugh Armstrong, the man I married more than 45 years ago, although we have together been committed to working collectively with many others. But I have to say this too has involved often rigorous and, should I say, vigorous debate. And most of my research has focused on work, broadly defined, and on policy related to work. Equally important, almost all of it has focused on Canada, as Colin said. In my undergraduate experience at the University of Toronto, my only exposure to Canadian content was Rex Lucas's research on the Spring Hill mine disaster, which, while excellent, simply made me feel claustrophobic. Although I did learn that you could drink urine and keep alive. After working for two years in the student movement and the emerging women's movement, I wanted to know more about Canada and more about women so that we could change the kinds of existing relations. So I enrolled in Carleton's Canadian Studies program that was then only a decade old. An article on racist segregation in US employment started us thinking about women's segregation in gender-specific jobs in the labor force. Recognizing that numbers matter and committed to doing research that would be readily accessible, we developed a simple way of measuring what we called sex concentration and sex typing in the paid workforce. The first indicated the proportion of all employed women working in an occupation, and the second, the percentage of an occupation that is female, simple, eh? But that's what we strive to do to make the argument and evidence seem obvious and simple to understand. The approach was attractive enough that Statistics Canada now uses it and others have adopted the language of segregation. And it was enough to get us our first referee journal article in the Canadian Review of Sociology's first issue dedicated to women, or at least women's issues, I should say. I should also add that the work would not have been possible without Statistics Canada. It gave us access to raw data that allowed us to build an historical analysis that met their criteria, something they initially thought could not be done. This kind of access is very unlikely to happen with students today, even if Stat Statistics Canada still collected reliable data in the area of interest. In keeping with feminist political economy, though, it was important to also explore the nature of women's work in the home and community and to relate this work to what women do for pay. The result was my master's thesis that turned into the double ghetto, Canadian women and their segregated work. It hit a chord, our timing was right, and it sold so well that royalty sent our kids to camp. It was also the first of many that failed to sell well in the United States. It was pointed out to us when we were at a conference, in uh, an international conference, actually it was a NATO conference, believe it or not, uh, that US publications do not say that they're about the United States. They simply say it's women's work, right? And we were told by the then quite famous economist, Barbara Bergman, that it would, be, it would sell in the United States if we took Canada out of the title. Well, times have not changed much, even when we leave off the Canada, most recently, we were told by a series editor for Canal University Press that our book, Critical to Care, The Invisible Women in Health Services, covered a whole new area and one very relevant to the US, but wouldn't sell there because it was about Canada. Indeed, she said it would sell well if it was about somewhere different, like Ulaanbaatar. Uh, but I'm still committed to writing books about Canada and even putting Canada on the title. It was the double ghetto that led to me uh, being invited to be a witness in the Action Travail de Femmes case uh, against this, the Canadian National Railway. The case eventually went to the Supreme Court, where the landmark decision recognized both systemic discrimination against women and that action must be taken to address it. In the following years, as Leah said, I served as an expert witness in more than a dozen cases. Although I did appear in the Symes case and in some other like it, most of the cases uh, I served on were about pay equity. Canada was a leader in this field, and I had the privilege of working with lawyers such as Mary Cornish, academics such as Ronnie Steinberg, union leaders such as Elizabeth Miller, and graduate students, or at least graduate students as they were then, uh, such as Jan Kaner, on figuring out how to explain complex federal and provincial legislation and how to understand pay equity. In thinking back, I'm reminded of a bumper sticker I saw recently. 
don't believe everything you think. I'm reminded because we were battling against explicit and implicit thinking about women and their work. One tribunal chair asked me, didn't work, women work so they could get out of the house? So I described what it was like to work in a chicken processing plant. And they actually asked me to stop halfway through the description. We had to explain pay equity was about jobs done primarily by women and primarily by men, not about women's personal characteristics such as marital status and employment history. With detailed evidence, we were able to demonstrate that not only was the labor force segregated in ways that did not reflect skills, effort, responsibility, and working conditions, but also that the segregation was accompanied by wage discrimination. It was separate and unequal. Two of the early cases before the Ontario Pay Equity Tribunal established precedents on implying pay equity that are used around the world, and many led to huge settlements for women, albeit often years later. Indeed, the Canada Post case I testified in almost three decades ago just recently met payments of 250 million plus interest to those in female-dominated jobs who are still alive. When I first testified, one of the lawyers became a father. When I next testified, the child was in university. Unfortunately, many of those victories are slowly being eroded, as is pay equity itself. Most recently, I've written an affidavit in a case against the federal government arguing the omnibus bill of a couple of years ago effectively canceled pay equity for federal employees. Our work took a turn in the 1980s when our daughter broke her leg quite badly at school. When we finally found her in the hospital, the nurses wanted to show me, and not you, where to empty the bedpan, where I could find something for her to drink, and where I could spend the night. The profound gendered division of labor was everywhere in the hospital, a gendered division that was also racialized. We began to realize that the hospital was a microcosm of all aspects of women's work, paid and unpaid, union and non-union, high-tech and low-tech, managerial and domestic, volunteer and underground, public and private. Hospitals offered a wonderful site to explore the complexity of women's work, to lump and to slice. We quickly learned, as we should have known as feminist political economists, that we had to know more about healthcare in order to study a hospital and to locate healthcare within global developments. As we learned more and more about healthcare, we became more and more convinced about the specificity of healthcare, that it is significantly different from other services and other sectors, and so is the work of care. We also became more and more committed to public healthcare as we learned why it's not only Canada's best loved social program, but also a defining feature of being Canadian. We formed a research group that lasted for a decade. It included Eric Michalowski, then, and then doctoral student, and now a professor here in sociology, and Jackie Schwanier, then working for the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, but now also a professor at York, and uh, a member of our research team, current research team. We worked closely with unions, interviewing workers and surveying those who had been patients about the emerging healthcare reforms. The result was four books and a number of reports on the negative consequences for work and care, as well as an article on methodology focusing on imminent critique. Our research was the entire range, uh, with the entire range of those employed in hospitals showed that workers were facing increasing stress as women in particular struggled to make up for the care deficit and the increasing routinization of care work. One press release and media coverage resulted in a call to a meeting with the government. Their representatives demanded we tell them the names of the hospitals where the interviewees worked. We, of course, refused, but when press did the Spartacus thing and said we were convinced it was all of them. In keeping with our methodology, we had taken our analysis of interviews to a group of hospital workers we had not interviewed and asked them what we got right, what we got wrong, and what we had missed. Although we had not interviewed anyone from their hospitals, they responded by saying they were upset that we'd not interviewed them when we talked with others from their hospital. So convinced were they that the analysis fit them and thus confirming our attempt to capture general patterns. I should also say the government representatives threatened to take uh, Jackie's nursing license away because she had a, 
uh, responsibility to report any bad conditions. My favorite story from those interviews is one told by a group of male hospital maintenance workers. Called to a training session on teamwork, they were told by the management consultant to pretend they were an Oxford rowing team and to work together to win. Upset by the workers' lack of activity, the consultant asked why they were just sitting there. Their response was, we put a motor on the back. It, it seemed to be more uh, appropriate for these maintenance workers than pretending they were an Oxford rowing team, for sure. The Con Conference Board of Canada was upset by another press release on a study of total quality management, the then latest flavor in the month uh, as uh, management professor Henry Mintzberg puts it. But when we were invited to their board meeting and outlined our analysis, several of their members acknowledged that we'd exposed fundamental problems with the approach as applied in healthcare. We were particularly concerned about healthcare privatization. We and others had produced lots of evidence about the negative impact on quality and equity, the, but the promise of more efficient and effective care combined with hysterical stories about wait times meant more and more people were convinced public health care is not sustainable and that privatization is the answer. Privatization is complex, however, and difficult to explain in public meetings. Moreover, much of it is happening by stealth. So we developed a way of describing forms of what we called cascading privatization, privatization that trickled down to drown those at the bottom. We identified six forms of privatization based on the kinds of ideas I described earlier in terms of feminist political economy. The first is the privatization of care work that comes with more care sent home and less care provided in hospitals and nursing homes. The second is the privatization of responsibility or what is often called the responsabilization of care. Third is the privatization of the way care work is managed as methods from the for-profit sector are adopted in the public sector. Fourth, the privatization of delivery through contracting out of services, through handing some services order to the for-profit sector and through public-private partnerships. Fifth, the privatization of costs through delisting and the failure to cover new services. And sixth, the privatization of decision making, especially as large foreign owned corporations move into health services. All these forms result in more inequities in access and in workloads, as well as in poorer quality care. This approach to privatization was adopted by a, a group I chaired for more than a dozen years, the group that uh, Leah mentioned, Women in Healthcare Reform, funded under the contribution program at Health Canada. Our mandate uh, was to coordinate research across the five and later four centers of excellence, to identify and fill gaps, to influence policy, and to share knowledge with a wide variety of women. It, a modest mandate, one that reminds me of a headline long ago in an Australian feminist newspaper that said, after you've caused inflation and unemployment, it's hard to know what to cook for dinner. Together for such a long time, we were able to develop a set of guiding questions and a common theoretical framework, as well as a methodology that drew on multiple disciplines and techniques. We asked three questions. Why is this a women's issue? What are the issues for women? And for which women? We organized workshops that included care providers, policymakers, researchers, and people from community organizations. Our first ones, spontaneously resulted in the Charlottetown Declaration on the Right to Care, a, a title that only Canadians really get, a policy statement on home care and unpaid work that has been held up as an example by other countries and still stands up as a set of principles based on equity in care. This workshop and others resulted in what we called our popular pieces Um, that were distributed not only in classrooms, but also in communities, unions, religious organizations, and governments. The Pan American Health Organization translated and reproduced more than one. They were used as a model in a number of both high and low income countries. Because we were a stable group, we were able to respond quickly to new issues. 
For example, when the Romano Report on the Future of Healthcare was released, we quickly wrote Reading Romano, a critique that pointed out that the report failed to recognize the very gendered nature of healthcare work and health services, with negative consequences not only for women, but also for policy planning in general. Similarly, we were able to convince Dr. Postel to add our appendix on gender to his federal report on wait times. Our three books were another way of connecting one of the multiple strategies we used in fulfilling our mandate. Sadly, Health Canada's commitment to women's health has slowly withered away, but you can still find our materials on the web. The research I did with the group was undoubtedly a factor in my recent invitation to write a report for the Pan American Health Organization. Based on research in Canada and abroad, I argued that the un unpaid health care is a gender issue, an equity issue, and a human rights issue. It's a gender issue because women and girls throughout the world do the overwhelming majority of unpaid health care. It's an equity issue, not only because women do much more of this labor and more of the labor that is most demanding and daily, it's also an equity issue because women with the fewest economic resources are the most likely to do the heaviest work and because those who need care experience inequities in the amount and quality of care they receive as a result. And these inequities are too often racialized as well as classed and gendered. Unfortunately, it will be harder and harder to track this work, and who does it, in Canada, because in 2011, the federal government removed the question on it from the census. What we don't know, though, may hurt us all. Apparently, electronic surveillance of our conversation is fine, but it's not okay to ask about the number of bathrooms or who does the unpaid work. Unpaid care in and out of the labor force remains essential to our analysis. Our feminist political economy approach, informed by the growing literature on the determinants of health, led us to argue that laundry, housekeeping, dietary, and character work are critical parts of health services and have a different character when they are done with health within health services. I kept thinking of that sperm still on Monica Lewinsky's dress after dry cleaning and was sure hospital laundry had to be done differently. Even Romano called these hot hotel services, failing to recognize their particular character and the need to ensure these mainly female workers are part of the healthcare team. Defining them as hotel services helped justify contracting the work out to international chains and serving patients in Ottawa with toast made in Moncton. Our research, along with that of numerous others, helped unions resist this contracting and in some cases led to work being brought back in-house. It also formed part of the context section uh, that we wrote with uh, Kate Laxer for Leah's uh, Gender and Work database and later for her Comparative Perspectives database. Our theory and research also led us to argue that the conditions of work are the conditions of care. Too often these are separated, as they are, for example, in patient-centered policies. It seems obvious that providing good care is hard to do when you have no time, few resources, little power, and minimum staffing, although the connection is seldom made in policy. Our international surveys of workers in long-term residential care was particularly effective in making the case. Personal support workers in Canada were more than six times as likely as those in Nordic countries to say they face violence on a daily basis. Yet the residents are similar, with similar uh, proportions diagnosed with forms of dementia and complex physical needs. It's the conditions that are different. Nordic countries have much higher resident to staff ratios, workers have greater autonomy, and they spend way less time filling out forms saying what they have done instead of actually doing it, as is the case in Canada. We were surprised by one thing. Nordic workers indicated they had less time than Canadian workers to take residents for a walk. Then we discovered Canadian workers thought of walking as the trip from the room to the dining room, whereas the Nordic workers thought about it as taking people outside for a stroll something that's not even on the radar of the Canadian workers. Not surprisingly, given their increasing workload, their growing stress and lack of control, healthcare workers have the highest rates of absences due to illness and injury, with the highest rates amongst those who provide the direct personal care, especially in long-term residential care. And this is in spite of the fact that many go to work when they are ill, 
because they do not want to let the residents or other workers down and or because they have used up their sick days. Our evidence suggests that the explanation for differences in violence workers face and for the rising absences due to illnesses or injury can be found in structures more than in individuals who provide care or in terms of the diagnosis of residents. It is, we argue, a form of structural violence. For Johan Galtung, a Norwegian sociologist, we take the notion that structural violence can be understood as the conditions that prevent people from reaching their potential. Our research on long-term residential care indicates that workers can usually see what needs to be done for residents and often know how to do it, but are too often prevented from doing it. It is mainly structures that are the cause, and the consequences they feel in their bodies and minds cannot primarily be attributed to their individual practices or the individual residents they care for. Listen to this exchange among workers we interviewed, and I actually think these were interviewed by Lynn Spink, who's here, uh, to see if our analysis of the survey data resonated with them. So they begin, as far as toileting goes, I think that as workers we feel we're doing the best of our ability to do it. I don't know about anybody else, but do you know that in the last year or so, they have really, really pushed the use of incontinent products? And that's wrong because what I'm seeing, and I mean, I've worked in the facility for 27 years, so I've seen the changes from using, you know, cloth material as diapers to, you know, disposable diapers to depends that they've got now. And what they're using now, they're limiting us to how many depends that we can put on these residents. And another worker from another facility says, yeah, we're not allowed to change these residents unless they're 75%. And another says, don't get us wrong, because we're not saying that they're being toileted on a regular basis, because that's so not what's happening. We're caring for them the best we can, but they're sitting in diapers that are saturated because they say that they hold all this liquid. Another says, yeah, and that product, and they don't. And another, yeah, and they're limiting us, and I'm telling you, they're monitoring it. And, and yet another says, they, they have diaper police. Another one adds, there's only so many that are sent to each unit. It's one per shift. It's unbelievable. And management will go around and they will look in all the closets and all the drawers and they will pull all the hidden stuff out. I mean, the girls hide it all over. And then another one says, we have to steal them. And, and yet another intervention, don't get us wrong, because we're not saying that they're being toileted on a regular basis. That's so not what's happening. We're caring for them the best we can, but they're sitting in diapers that are saturated because they say that they hold all this liquid in that product, and they don't, adds another, and another says, there's only so many sent to each unit. It's unbelievable. And then the 75%, they explain, refers to the thin blue line on the diaper indicating the urine has soaked 75% of the diaper. The thin blue line means workers feel violated, and so do the residents and their families. And it is the structures that create these conditions because the workers know when people need to have their diapers changed or go to the toilet. But our notion of structural violence does not ignore the importance of education. From Paul Farmer, an American anthropologist and physician, we take the idea that structural violence can be understood as preventing people from gaining the knowledge necessary to reach their potential. And we've heard from many of those employed in long-term residential care that they do not have the knowledge required to deal with the increasingly complex needs of residents. Structural violence means understanding that structures can be violent in their consequences, not only for workers, but also for those in their care. This work prompted me to return once again to the issue of skills, something I've been struggling with for many years. Starting with Harry Braverman, political economists, including us, have been focusing on conditions that de-skill workers. When the Canadian Review of Sociology asked me to write on feminist political economy for their anniversary issue this year, I went back over old issues and decided others like Leo Vosco had already done an excellent job of summarizing the contributions. However, skills have been off the agenda since the debates around pay equity and more recently around emotional labor. I argue that instead of focusing primarily on processes that remove the requirement for skills, we need to focus on conditions that prevent people from developing and using the skills they need and from having those skills appropriately valued. 
And in doing so, we have to be very aware of the way skills in their evaluation have become so gendered and racialized. Which takes me to now. I've been using the example of long-term residential care because that's where much of our uh, current research is focused. Given my age and that of some of my colleagues in the project, there's more than a touch of self-interest in our attempt to make long-term residential care a positive option. But it's also very much in keeping with our past research, as unplanned as much of that trajectory has been. It is collective, working with a wide range of actors in and out of academe. It builds on what those doing the work tell us and is oriented to making change for equity based on evidence that employs multiple methods and takes very many interdisciplinary approaches. We have seven years for our project on reimagining long-term residential care, an international study of promising practices, and nested within it is a project on healthy aging in residential places. It involves 25 faculty members from 12 jurisdictions, along with more than 40 students, some of whom are here right now, five union partners, and both a seniors and employers organization. It's primarily focused around four areas, approaches to care, work organization, accountability in governments, and financing and ownership, or FNO, as our project uh, manager, Wendy Winters, calls it. Using multiple methods, we began by doing what we call analytical mapping, designed to develop not just a portrait, but also an analysis of what long-term residential care looks like in our jurisdictions. The result has been a host of publications, presentations, and workshops, including our most recent paper on how scandals in multiple countries reflect growing privatization and result in regulations that fail to create quality conditions or care. We're also employing and expanding upon an approach called rapid site switching ethnography. Our seminar series here at York that involved both uh, students and faculty resulted in our just out book, Trouble in Care, Troubles the categories and identifies very troubling aspects of long-term residential care, and some of the authors are here in this room. The project is about working for care and caring for work, not only for project members, but also for those paid and unpaid who are the focus of our study, and of course, for the residents and their supporters. The point, of course, is not simply to understand the world, but to change it. And we're working hard to make this as a collective, democratic, and equally important fun project. We want to dance in our revolution in long-term care. So this brings me, me back to Nellie McClung and my contradictory position. On the one hand, I, as I wrote this, I got more and more depressed by how so much that we've worked for has gone or is being undermined, including the Ontario Training Center uh, diploma that uh, Leah mentioned, except perhaps for the joint Trent Carleton doctoral program in Canadian studies that I helped uh, set up. On the other hand, this is obviously no time to feel old with so much more to do. A woman's work is never done. Thank you. <laughs> we don't want to stand between you and, and a glass of wine, but uh, I'm not sure where they are. <laughs> we have empty wine glasses here. They may be out there, but, uh, um, but I'd just like to thank you very much, Pat, for giving just a wonderful talk. And one of the things, again, uh, following that British model of the inaugural lecture, I think that one of the things that those lectures are supposed to do is to convince everybody in the audience of why that person has received the recognition that they've had in their career. And I think your, your uh, talk did exactly that. And it really pleasure to hear, hear what you're saying. One of the things I, I want, maybe want to underline is not only Pat's contribution to uh, the study of Canada, uh, but also the way in which she sets it in this international context, because I think that's really important as well. There, it's quite appropriate to do research on Canada and focus only on Canada, uh, but for many people, uh, it's also very useful to, uh, to look outside and make those comparisons to, to other uh, jurisdictions. If I can ask one question, we will flow, uh, throw, throw the floor open for a, for a few minutes for questions. Be, well, well, the uh, before the wine. The the wine the, 
with the wine wedding questions. But it strikes me that one of the one of the um, reasons that uh, medical care and health care is such an important issue to talk in a Canadian studies context is because it's such an important constituent uh, uh, element of Canadian identity. If you ask Canadians what is ca Canadian about Canada, one of the first things they will say is we have a medical, we have Medicare, we have a, we have a socialized medical system. What you've presented today is, is not entirely optimistic. And I wonder if you want to make a link uh, between that way in which Canadians have held on to medical care and health care as an important part of their self-definition and some of the trends that are occurring today. Well, every poll says it's still Canada's best love social program. And uh, there's no question that uh, Canadians support public health care, but they have been increasingly convinced that we can't afford it. And um, as uh, a number of Canadian uh, economists, health economists have said, we can afford what we want to afford in terms of health care in Canada that the question is a question of values, it's not a question of money, but we have been increasingly convinced, I think, that uh, we can't, uh, we, it can't be sustained in the way it is being offered now. Uh, I think that what can't be sustained, and it's actually what I was going to talk about until t today, when you first asked me, until I realized that you wanted to talk about, <laughs> me to talk about something else, was about the sustainability problem in healthcare is not the money, I don't think. The sustainability is the labor force. And we are really wiping out that labor force and not replacing it because of the way we're organizing uh, work in, uh, in care. And it's, it's particularly obvious in long-term residential care, which isn't part, or at least uh, isn't a full part of our public health care system. I, I think that uh, the major problem in our health care system has been that we've introduced more privatization and that we didn't follow the recommendation of the Hall Commission that said what you need is an integrated public system that covers everything because then you will have the most efficient allocation of, of people in terms of care. So that uh, because we funded hospitals, for instance, uh, universal coverage for hospitals and medical care, what happened was that a whole lot of things got put in the hospital so that the feds would pay half, <laughs> right? Like psychiatric care, instead of saying, where is the most appropriate people with these needs? Uh, and uh, so uh, the real issue is, how are we going to extend the healthcare system that is public rather than cut it, cutting it back? And there's no question the most uh, expensive parts are the private parts, if I'm, the privatized parts, I should say. <laughs> Um, so, so the um, uh, drugs, drugs are, uh, we spend almost as much on drugs as we do on doctors, right? Um, and the, what often gets left out of the conversation is the enormous amount we spend on, you know, beds in hospitals and, and the other kinds of technologies that are used, all of which are privatized, and uh, increasingly, uh, huge parts of long-term care because what used to be called homes for the aged are now retirement homes that are virtually all privatized and profit-making, right? And many of which are owned by international corporate chain. One of the points I was trying to make on privatization is also when they're owned by big international chains, we lose control, you know, because of the free trade agreements and uh, because they can, do, they can do what they want, basically. They can run away, they can closed down like Southern Cross did in, uh, in uh, England, and who's left holding the bag, right? Because are you going to, if the private chain says it's no longer lucrative for us to run this long-term care facility and we're not going to do it anymore, well, what government is going to say we're going to have all those people out on the street, so we take it back, you know? And the same is true with the public-private partnerships and hospitals. We're not going to say, oh, they're not making any money anymore, so they'll leave, and so we'll. Um, so that's what's not sustainable, I think. And it back to why it is Canada's best love social program. 
And Tony Maioni has written about how when we introduced uh, universal, first universal hospital insurance and then medical insurance, that there was more support for universal, a public system in the United States than there was in Canada. What's made people support it in Canada was not that, you know, we were all socialists. What, what made people support it is that it worked. And that created the sense of solidarity. So the sense of solidarity was in many ways created by the evidence that to do a public system really meant good care, could really mean good care, rather than people somehow getting this idea that they would, that you know, a public system is what would work best. I'm, I'm going long, long, long so that we can, uh, but I think it's here. if I could ask you to uh, uh, please come down afterwards and, and, and enjoy a glass of wine and some wine and cheese. But please, first of all, join me in thanking Pat Armstrong for presenting such a, a wealth of her research and her work. I think we have such a strong sense of her career trajectory and, and of all the contributions that she has made in her studies and of the importance as well of many of the current issues that we're facing. Our government has not shut down over healthcare issues like our neighbors to the south right now, uh, but these are obviously issues that are, are uh, highly relevant to uh, not just those of us in North America, but around the world. But thank you very much, Pat, for doing this today. Thank you.